Chapter 11 Hard Rain, Soft Airstrips One Sunday early in May 1951, storm clouds began to gather in the skies all around Akobo. It was oppressively hot and humid. When night came, the bright new moon was soon blotted out by approaching storms. Spasmodic lightning illuminated the wide horizon. Answering thunder echoed close by. Later in the night, a strong wind blew up. Steve, Kay, the children and I tumbled out of our beds on the veranda of the decrepit little rest house just as the storm hit. Rain beat furiously on the corrugated iron roof above our heads, making such a din that we could scarcely hear ourselves speak. It was even hard to think. Crude canvas blinds had been rolled down over the wire-screened window openings and veranda to keep rain out. Now we rushed round, rolling them up, lest they should be torn off in the fierce wind. The beds got wet. Rain poured through gaps in the roof. The floors swam with water. We moved the most vulnerable articles onto chairs and tables. For two hours, we listened to the heavy tropical downpour. I wonder how our wooden plane is doing out there in all of this, I groaned. Steve wondered too and added his own question. What'll all this water be doing to the airstrip? Dawn came. Fifty millimetres of rain had fallen, and we found the strip was quite soft. We were due to take off to pick up a missionary in Malakal. We'll let the sun work on the strip for a couple of hours, said Steve. Then we can see if it'll be safe for takeoff. We spent the time refueling and cleaning the plane. About 10 a.m. we decided to go. But the plane taxied only a few yards before one wheel sank deep into a muddy crack in the cotton soil. I jumped out and with help from some Anuaks who'd been watching, we pushed and pulled while Steve revved the engines. We managed to get clear of the hole and on to a better spot. I resumed my seat in the radio compartment. We can't taxi too slowly or the same will happen again. Steve called to me over his shoulder as he opened up the throttles for another attempt. This time we kept moving fast enough to prevent the wheels sinking into the mud and managed to get airborne before the end of the strip. During the next three weeks, another three big storms, as well as some lesser ones, struck a Kobo. Nearly 200 millimetres of rain fell in that time. We'd moved to a Kobo in the dry season and had worked hard on the airstrip, but the rains were already threatening to make it unusable. Perhaps we could add sand from the river to improve the cotton soil and make the surface less vulnerable to the rains. It was a mammoth task. Anuak and Nua men dug the sand out of the riverbed whilst women carried it up the bank in four-gallon tins. All the car and aviation fuel came in these. The sand was emptied into the mission's pickup truck and driven the half-mile to the airstrip. Steve had grown up on a farm and was used to dealing with the soil. He supervised the laying of a narrow sandy carpet along the centre of the strip, just wide enough for the wheels of the plane. A wooden beam towed behind the mission jeep scraped it all level. It certainly made a difference, but not enough to cope with the rains as they became more regular. It would take several years of such treatment to render the airstrip reasonably usable throughout the wet season. Even with the sand, taking off from the Kobo became like taking off with our brakes partly on. It was nerve-wracking. The soft, clinging soil didn't want to let go of the wheels. The longer the rains continued, the deeper became the softness of the ground and the greater the problem we were in danger of being marooned. The new service we'd started could be brought to a total halt just at the time missions were most cut off and most in need of us. We didn't really want to move. We'd just begun to feel settled at Akobo, but we had to find a base with a better airstrip. We chose Doro, 150 miles to the north, and we flew all across in the Rapide with our few worldly possessions. 
The Morrows had left Doro, and S.I.M. gladly lent their old house to the Stevens. I had an African-style tukul nearby, fourteen feet in diameter, grass-thatched, mud-walled. I shared it with the occasional scorpion and rat, and with the rain that came through the roof during storms. The soil on the Doro airstrip was considerably better than at Okobo, and we worked hard on it. But one day we came out after a storm to be met by an amazing sight. The rapide sat reflected in a half-mile-long lake, its wheels awash. Better drainage was vital, so Steve's farming experience was again put to use. We found the lowest points in the surrounding area and dug ditches to drain the rainwaters down to them, allowing the strip to dry out more quickly. The work in those days was very experimental. There was still much to learn about the different types of soil. Conditions and problems varied greatly as we passed through the wet and dry seasons. At the beginning of the rains, for instance, the surface soil would become slippery, whilst the undersoil was still firm. The plane might tend to skid, but the wheels would not sink in. Later on in the season, when the rain had penetrated deeper, a day or two of sun could bake the surface into a hard crust, apparently firm, but leaving the undersoil still very soft. The wheels of the plane were then liable to break through the crust into the mud below. That could flip the plane on its back when taxiing, taking off, or landing. Those on the ground needed to know when a strip was safe because they were responsible for signalling to us whether or not we could land. How soft could it be before they warned us off? We tried to develop tests for them. There was a heel test. If you dug your heel in and it went more than two inches deep, it meant the strip was not safe. One of the best tests was to drive a loaded vehicle along the strip at about 50 miles an hour, as George Morrow had done when they first made the Doro landing ground. This showed up dangerous undulations and also, if the vehicle left deep tracks, demonstrated that the subsoil was wet and unsafe. We'd already discovered that if we taxied too slowly on a soft strip, the wheels would sink into muddy spots and stop the plane altogether. Steve continued to use the technique of taxiing fast enough to prevent this and usually gain sufficient speed for takeoff. Taxiing a little faster gave some lift to the wings, helping to reduce the weight on the wheels and lessen the likelihood of bogging down. Stan McMillan, who had gone to the rescue of the Guths as they struggled to reach Malut, was now in charge of an SIM station at Abayat, which was in the middle of the Dinka Plains. With him, as well as his wife and young daughter, were two single lady missionaries. The senior, Marie Anderson, came from Canada and had been there for some five years, working among the people in the surrounding villages. The younger, Phyllis Bappel, had for three years worked as Mal Forsberg's secretary in Khartoum. Feeling God was calling her to work among the Dinkas, she had been posted to Abayat. The Dinkas often gave their villages nasty names with the idea of frightening away evil spirits. Abayat means the Yath, or village of the devil. The local witch doctors there strongly opposed the Christian message. A number of years before, when the first missionary couple came, a curse was put on a leg of goat, which was then given to them. They cooked it and ate it gladly. The village people expected to hear the death wail during the night, but nothing happened. The next morning, when they saw all the family walking about, they were mystified and then chagrined. Finally, they admitted that the power of the new god must be stronger than theirs. One witch doctor became a Christian and burned her witchcraft paraphernalia. The work at Abayat, however, was always a struggle. Sickness was prevalent. There were times when a plane would have made the difference between life and death. Two small children have been buried there, Eileen and Bobby. Bobby's grave was marked only by a bush, but I have stood by Eileen's lonely gravestone more than once, 
and thought of the parents' grief. An airstrip had now been cleared in the grass just in front of the two mission houses. It immediately relieved some of the stress of isolation. Before the rains had started, Steve and I had been asked to fly in. Stan Macmillan had become quite ill. We flew him and his wife to Khartoum for treatment. The new strip had been easy to use. There was nothing to get in the way as you made your landing approach, just the open grasslands. Phyllis Bappel used to write home regularly to her parents in America, giving them the latest news and, incidentally, a vivid insight into the conditions at places like Abayat. June 11th, 1951. With the Macmillans gone, Marie and I are now alone on the station. On Thursday evening we had quite a hard rain, just before dark. We had to hustle to get the windmill and its water pump turned off, so that it wouldn't get broken in the strong winds. Then there were shutters to be put up in the house, and big holes to be filled in, where rain was pouring under the foundations. At about 9.30 this morning, it started really pouring, and kept it up all day. Our rain gauge showed 70 millimetres had fallen. It was interesting to see the dry season cracks in the soil fill up. We were expecting some of our people to come from Malut and Paluich today. They were to be here, ready to go out on Monday, when the MAF plane comes. Now we are wondering if they will make it. We are wondering, too, if the plane is going to be able to land. If the ground is too soft, we are supposed to make a large X on the field with sheets. We can't help but feel the responsibility of it, and are praying that we will know what to do. Either it will be so wet that we will know to put the cross out, or so dry that we will be sure that it isn't necessary. Later, the sun came out, and the ground started to dry, but word has been sent to MAF not to come. The airstrip will still be too soft. But we don't know if this message will reach them. It has to go via Sudanese telegraph from Malut and may not reach them in time. If it doesn't, we must be on the job tomorrow in case they come. If it doesn't rain again, they should be able to land by Tuesday or Wednesday. Monday morning arrived bright and we again tested the airstrip. We decided the plane shouldn't land, though we felt it might just be possible. After all, we are just girls and wouldn't know for sure. About the middle of the morning, we heard a plane and ran out to see the MAF plane appearing in the distance. You should have seen us tearing around, getting the cross of sheets spread out on the ground. We were so excited. The plane flew quite low, and we waved. Then it came over again, lower, and we began to be afraid that it would land. 